Will you turn with me to Revelation chapter 11, a chapter that we've been studying together for a number of weeks now, and it's an absolutely incredible chapter, and uh, I do pray that one, uh, when, when you get home and you've got a chance today just to read through it, and to read through Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 11. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege of being able to gather together this morning to study your word. And Lord, we thank you for the wonders of your word. Lord, in many ways it can be so complex, there's so much here. And uh, in other ways, Lord, it's so simple. And uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for its simplicity. Um, but Lord, we ask you in your grace to speak to us this morning. May you send your Holy Spirit in a very powerful way. May you give us understanding. May you speak through the weakness of the preacher today. And uh, Lord, may your Holy Spirit move up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. May you bend down and touch our hearts and give each and every one of us understanding. May you excite us in terms of the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, we live in a world today where we get so caught up in the issues at work and the issues at the office and personal relationship issues and what irritates us and what moves us and issues over government and politics and all the things that just run a country and, and, and affect a person and a nation. And uh, Lord, when the priority really is at the end of the day, are we ready for Jesus? And Lord, we ask and pray in your grace that you speak into our hearts over this, that you impress the wonder and the truth of this into our lives, and you help us to take our stand as we should. For Jesus' sake, can God's people say? <coughs> well, we reach a milestone in our study of the book of Revelation. As we come to chapter 11, verses 14 to 19, John writes for us, if you look at it, The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your servants and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Wow. Now we approach a very important chapter today, a chapter which marks the end of the first half of the book and the introduction to the second half of the book of Revelation. Now you'll remember that for a few weeks we have been studying the first part of Revelation chapter 11, the coming of two very powerful preachers that God is going to send to Israel in the first three and a half years of the world's peace agreement with Israel and the Arab nations in the Middle East. And that the Word of God tells us, according to the book of Ezekiel, that there's going to be a war in the Middle East that will lead to a major conflict. And uh, a number of countries will be involved in that, Iran, Turkey, a number of countries will be involved in that, Egypt will be involved. And after this major war that affects the Middle East, there will be a signing of a peace agreement in the Middle East, and the world will be able to get it down to seven years agreement. It'll be the first time in world history that there is a limit on peace. It'll be signed for seven years, and that is all the world can guarantee the Middle East is a seven-year peace agreement. And these two preachers will appear, and Scripture tells us that uh, their preaching will be absolutely instrumental after the signing of this peace agreement in the final conversion of the people of Israel to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, immediately after they have finished their ministry, and Israel, Revelation 11 verse 13, turns and gives glory to God. In other words, there is major conversion in Israel. It says in Revelation 11 14, the second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. Now, what are these first, second, and third woes that the Bible talks about? Well, let me just refresh your memory for a moment. Look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. John turns and he writes, 
As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, 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 there's the three woes, to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. And so the three woes here are the last three trumpets to be blown by the last three angels of God over the earth. And the first woe, you'll remember, in our study came in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, with the blowing of the fifth trumpet. And that was the release uh, uh, of hordes of demons like locusts that will fly over the earth and literally torment mankind for five months, says the Bible. I'm sure you'll remember the locusts that we went and studied. The second woe, or the sixth trumpet, came in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13, which brings about the release of four demon generals that will be released, the Bible says, from the river Euphrates as it dries up, and they will lead an army of fallen angels of 200 million to torture mankind. And at the moment, it's out of interest, the river Euphrates is drying up for the first time in world history. It's one of the major river tributaries going right back to the Garden of Eden. And for the first time, that river is drying up. They're finding caves and buildings and tunnels and various things under the river that they've never known were actually there. And this woe, as Revelation 11.15 indicates, is the seventh trumpet of God. And this trumpet completes God's plan for the ending of our entire universe. The ending of our universe. In Revelation chapter 10 verse 7, it says of the trumpet of God, But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound is what? Seventh trumpet. The mystery of God, in other words, the return of Jesus Christ, will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. And so this seventh trumpet of God signals the answer to the Lord's prayer that we as Christians have been praying for many centuries and that is thy kingdom come. We are calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ to return and the seventh trumpet of God is that which heralds that. For this trumpet announces to the universe the end of our world and the coming of God's eternal kingdom. And it goes all the way through to Revelation chapter 20 and the establishment of a brand new heavens and a brand new earth, which we all look so forward to. Amen? But in saying this, I need to bring to your attention that when the seventh trumpet of God is blown, it doesn't turn and it doesn't bring about the return of Jesus Christ immediately to this earth. It's not that the angel of God stands in heaven, blows the trumpet, and Jesus returns. It doesn't happen that way. It is first gives the signal to heaven for the release of seven bold judgments that are poured out on our earth by seven angels of God. And so we come then to a very important moment, literally in the book of Revelation, in our study of trying to understand what God is saying here. In that in God's final wrath against this earth, in the seven bowl judgments, uh, judgments, they are released by the blowing of the seventh trumpet of God. And so what you have, if you go back, right back to the beginning of Revelation, is firstly a seven-sealed scroll. And you can see it on behind me. In Revelation chapter 6, that is God's title deeds to the earth. That Jesus takes from the hand of God the Father and he breaks each and every one of those seals. And every time Jesus breaks a seal, a page of world history unfolds and events happen across the earth. Remember? And out of the seven seals come, secondly, seven trumpet judgments. And this final seventh trumpet that is blown releases 37 bold judgments and then Jesus Christ returns to the earth. We so often sit back and think, well, Jesus could come back tomorrow. Well, he could. But the fact is, according to God's word, there are seven trumpet judgments, there are seven bold judgments, and with that, Jesus returns. And so we turn today to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, to the announcement of the seventh trumpet of God. It is now time for the final woe of God to strike the earth. Are you ready for this today? Now, as always in the book of Revelation, I need to point out to you that the goal of the book of Revelation is not endless judgments. I think so often we sit back and we look at the book of Revelation, we think it's just woe and judgment and seas turning to blood and troubles and hardships and difficulties. But rather, the unveiling of the book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. 
It is there to exalt Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the book of Revelation. It is to glorify the Son of God for who Jesus Christ is. It is to exalt Jesus before the entire world and the entire universe. Something God told you, and I write at the very first line of the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation 1 verse 1. It says there that this is the book of who? The revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the book to reveal the glory of the Son of God. And that has always been this book's purpose, to reveal Jesus Christ to mankind, to show Jesus' glory to the entire world, to show the wonder of the God that you and I serve. It's a book of glory to God, not woe. Now look back at Revelation chapter 11, and, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to break it up into several parts and see how far we can get with it this morning. And so first of all, we see that the text opens with what I've kind of called Praise for sovereignty. Praise for sovereignty. In that as the seventh trumpet of God is about to be blown, we are, we are now standing at heaven's viewpoint. We're literally standing there and we've got heaven's perspective that is unveiling before us. And it's obvious that heaven is exhilarated at about what is to happen. Heaven is extremely excited. There's a, there's a movement that's running through heaven. Heaven is vibrating with excitement. Look at Revelation 11 verse 15. It says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were what? Loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his who? Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Wow. And then Revelation 11, look at verse 16 and 17. We see a further indication of the praise of heaven. It says, And the 24 elders, now they represent the church. Twelve tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. Twelve disciples of Jesus in the New Testament. Twelve plus twelve, twenty-four. Who were seated on thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power, and you, God, have begun to reign. And so we're looking at the seventh trumpet and world events to, to come as Jesus Christ returns from the heavens itself. This is heaven's perspective. This is how heaven feels about the return of Jesus Christ. And heaven is extremely excited about it. But this also depends on whose side you're on. For as it says, Revelation chapter 11, look at verse 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath, God, has come. The time has come for judging who? The dead. It's wrath, judgment, verse 18. And for destroying those who what? Destroy the earth. Wow. Don't think for a moment God is not interested in green peace. He is interested. After all, is God not the creator of this world? Is God not concerned about what we do with our world and our environment? And so God will judge those who go out of their way to destroy the planet. And so for the ungodly, the seventh trumpet heralds Jesus Christ's return. It is nothing more, uh, it heralds his return. And in terms of our friends and our family, people that you know, people in the nation, politicians, government, it may be nothing to them what God is saying here, but it is absolutely fundamental for their eternity. Because they will face the destruction and the judgment and the accountability of God for the lives they lived. And this destruction against the ungodly follows against them all the way through this particular book. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 18, for example, God sends, before Jesus' return, a worldwide earthquake that destroys in judgment the city of the Antichrist called Babylon, up near the oil fields in the Persian Gulf. And as you remember, Babylon was an ancient city going all the way back to the days of Nebuchadnezzar. It was an absolute ruin. Saddam Hussein went and rebuilt it for 190 million US dollars. And uh, so the walls are up, most of the buildings are up. And at the moment, it is a lockdown museum. But the Antichrist, the Bible says, will rehabilitate that city and he will move there and he'll make it the center of the world. It's right up near the Persian Gulf. It's right amongst the oil fields itself. And so he will move there and God will destroy that city, says the Bible, as well as all the cities of the world. Look at Revelation 16, verse 18. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been where? On the earth. 
Can you imagine an earthquake like this? No person has ever seen one in the, in the intensity that this is going to be. So tremendous was the quake, the great city, that's Babylon, was split into three parts. At the cities of the nations, all cities collapsed. Washington, New York, Johannesburg, Pretoria, they all collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. And so God will also not only destroy the cities, but he'll destroy the islands of the sea. Look at, the, look at verse 20. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found because of the earthquake. The United Kingdom, gone. All the islands of the sea, gone. From the sky, huge hailstones of about 50 kilograms each fell upon men and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, it tells us that during this period, Jesus is one who's literally going to wage war against the kings or the presidents and the leaders of this earth, and he will defeat them as God. Revelation 17, verse 12, the ten horns you saw are ten kings, that's ten world leaders, who have not yet received a kingdom. In other words, at the time John wrote, they didn't have a kingdom, they weren't in existence. But who for one hour, in other words a short period of time, will receive authority as kings, as world leaders, along with the beast. That's the Antichrist, the 666. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast, the Antichrist. They'll support him. They will make war against the Lamb, that's Jesus and Christianity. But the Lamb, Jesus, will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. In other words, Jesus will have the support of his own people. And this is why when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, Jesus turns and he says in Matthew 24 verse 29 that the world is going to look at Jesus' return not as an aspect of joy, but deep mourning and crying. The godless are going to be very unhappy about the return of the Son of God. Don't think the world's going to rejoice when Jesus Christ appears in the heavens. In fact, Jesus says of that time, look at Matthew 24, 29, Immediately after the distress of those days, it's going to be a tough time. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man, Jesus, will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will rejoice. Does it say that? No. They're going to mourn. They're going to cry. They will see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect, God's people, from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. And so for the world around you and I at large, the seventh trumpet and the return of Jesus Christ to this earth is not going to be something to look forward to or rejoice in. The majority of our planet, the people you're working with, are not going to be excited about the return of Jesus Christ. But for the godly, Revelation chapter 11, 18, it will be a time of great joy and rejoicing itself. Look at the comparison. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, it says, The nations were angry and your wrath, God, has come. The time has come for judging the dead. And then here is the comparison. And for rewarding who? Your servants, the prophets. That's God's faithful preachers. And your saints. That's Christians will be rewarded. And those who reverence your name, both small and great. And so a person's reaction to the seventh trumpet of God and what it brings, the ultimate return of Jesus Christ to this earth, depends on whose side you're actually on. If one's living a godless life, one's not going to be impressed with the return of the Son of God. But if you're living a life that is, uh, that is focused on Christ, it's going to be the greatest joy in one's own heart. For the world, for governments, the political parties, and the people you know, it is nothing to rejoice about. They will lose their little kingdoms. But for the Christian, for God's people, it is the hope of the century. It is the hope of the ages. A time of great reward. God will bless his servants. Every single Christian will be blessed like Jesus Christ. And heaven itself rejoices. The people of God are absolutely ecstatic. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. Look at Revelation eleven fifteen. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven. 
In other words, there was tremendous commotion going on in heaven. Heaven's suddenly no longer quiet. There's just commotion going on everywhere. Every living being there, be they angels or glorified saints and Christians, broke out into loud voices. Heaven is absolutely exuberantly excited. Jesus, the Son of God, is coming back to the world. The return of Christ is imminent. And they cried out, Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ Jesus, and he, Jesus, will reign forever and ever. Friends, that is the greatest excitement any person can ever speak about. In other words, what they are saying is that when the seventh trumpet sounds, the power of Satan and the sin of our world will be broken forever by God. It is gone. And the issue of who is sovereign over this earth, who is in charge, will be settled by God forever. The usurper Satan will be absolutely devastated. Christ is absolutely supreme as God. And as I said to you, this is something that Christians have gone and prayed for for absolute centuries. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. This is the greatest prayer that we've ever prayed for Jesus Christ to return. And now, by the seventh trumpet, this is becoming the reality of the book of Revelation. And heaven is exuberant. You'll remember in Luke 4 verse 5, that the devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Now who gave it to him was the Lord Jesus. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, Jesus Christ didn't want the world back on Satan's terms. But at the seventh trumpet, Jesus gets the world back on his terms. And heaven rejoices. There's excitement. The Son of God is about to claim the world back. Now I want you to notice something of interest here. Revelation 11, look at verse 15. It says, The kingdom, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Not kingdoms, not plural, but kingdom. The kingdom is in the singular. Do you see that? The world is one kingdom. That's what God is saying. It's one kingdom. And this is a very important note, one that is given with great uh, uh, um, uh, insight by the Holy Spirit himself. Because although in the world's view, this world is divided into many different nations. There's many different kingdoms. There's many different people. There's many different languages. There's many different cultures. There's many different governments. There's many different ideologies politically and all the rest. In God's view... This world, despite its languages, is really one kingdom under one king. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Satan is called the prince of this world. He's called the ruler of darkness. The devil is called the prince of the power of the air. Now God went and disrupted this kingdom at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 to make it more difficult for Satan to accomplish his purposes. That's where the languages of men came. That's where the nations of men came. God split man up and man moved out from the Tower of Babel. But the devil is still the prince of the pieces of a united kingdom. And in the end, this world is going to be reunited again under the power of a one world leader, says the Bible, an antichrist, a man who will appear on the world scene, who will bring peace to the Middle East. He will be world acclaimed and the world will turn and follow him and he will say that he's got the answers to the economic hardships and the problems of the world around us. Don't underestimate the unitedness of this world. It is really one kingdom under Satan itself. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 26, when the religious leaders accused Jesus Christ of casting out demons by Satan, Jesus turned and he said, If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom singular stand? One kingdom, how can it stand? The point is, said Jesus, Satan's kingdom stands because it is an undivided kingdom. 
It is a united kingdom, despite Babel. You say, but Mark, it is divided. When we sit back and we look at the world, everybody's divided. There are all types of nations. There's all types of languages, all types of cultures and customs and political viewpoints. Yes. But the term, in terms of the sinful hearts of men that are swayed this way and that, it is a united kingdom. Sin drives the hearts of men and women across the world. Just look, for example, in our own country, how political parties who seemingly divided different ideologies will sit down and support one another despite their different views. And if you look at our world, it's not the gospel of Jesus that unites a nation. It's not the gospel that's uniting our world, but the sinful hearts of men. It's the lying, it's the immorality, it's the violence, it's the lies that unite people together. You watch how many people sit down and watch just, for example, a film full of murder and violence and lies. And and the, the worse it is, the more entertainment and everybody sits down to watch it. That's what unites the globe. This world is one kingdom under one ruler. John chapter 14, 30, Satan. John chapter 16, 11, the devil. It's a sinful kingdom. And so Revelation 11 verse 15, the heavens rejoice at the blowing of the seventh trumpet because the singular kingdom of this world that has been under the power of Satan has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. There is a unitedness, there's a change in in command. It's a time of reigning and heaven rejoices, the saints rejoice, a change comes over this entire planet. Yes, this world in its blindness will mourn. Yes, people will cry out. You can imagine that person about to make some big multi-million deal with all the underhands that go on these days and suddenly Jesus appears in the sky. There's going to be mourning going on. And Satan himself is not going to relinquish the kingdoms of this world without a struggle. It's not going to be an easy time. I mean, just look at what is going to happen in the end times after the, after the signing of the peace agreement with Israel in the Middle East. Think of the ride of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that we went and studied in Revelation chapter 6. We saw there that the Antichrist is one who comes to power on the white horse. He proclaims peace. He comes as a man of great peace. He has a bow in his hand without arrows, showing that he's not coming necessarily for war, but he has tremendous military power and strength behind him. He proclaims strength, but war breaks out across the world soon after him taking power. War increases. Rumors of wars increase across the planet. Violence and murder become rife across the world. Starvation and famine and climatic changes and storms uh, 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 move across the planet. Change is rife. The cost of living goes up and up and up. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 6 that somebody will work all day, every day, just to put enough food on their table. Illnesses and pandemics will increase. Sword and famine and plague. Christian persecution in the world will grow. Demons will be overrunning the world, maiming everybody. You've got 200 million demons from the river Euphrates that have been released, moving across the earth. And the world is following a one world leader. It's not going to be easy. But Jesus conquers and the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at how Revelation 11.15 puts it. And I want you to notice how it's put in the ancient Greek language here. Revelation 11.15, it says, The kingdom of the world has become. The kingdom of the world has become. It's become what? The kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Amen? Now, that is called a prophetic aorist in the ancient Greek. It's a prophetic aorist. And it's a very important way to express something. And what it is saying is that in God's set plan, Jesus taking the world over uh, over as his kingdom, his kingdom is so certain, this is so sure, that we on earth can speak about it as though it has already happened. It's a prophetic aorist. Jesus is going to take the world back. It is so certain, it is so sealed in the books of heaven that you can talk about it as though it's already been done. Wow. Yes, Jesus Christ hasn't taken this world back yet. 
Yes, the seventh trumpet of God hasn't been blown. And even after that trumpet is blown, it's going to be some months before Jesus actually appears because you've got to go through all the bowl judgments. So it's going to be some months before he comes back. But it is so certain it can be spoken of as though it has already happened. Our Jesus will take this world back. There's no doubts. There's no debate. He is coming back. And one of these days, you and I will see Jesus Christ, the Son of God in the literal heavens. He will be there. And so what does heaven do? Heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. The Christians rejoice. It's almost like a newspaper article you and I are reading about, and it's already been written before it even happened. It's done. It's sealed. You and I as God's people this morning should be a people filled with rejoicing. We so often are caught up with all the complexities of the world around us. The issues at work, worries over finance, worries over this, worries over that, issues in the country. And we're so concerned about everything. We need to lift up our minds because our Savior is coming back. He is coming back. For Jesus came into this world not only to come and redeem people and save people, but Jesus is one who came into this world to be the great King. He is coming back as Lord. As the angel said to Mary in Luke 1 31, before Jesus' birth, he said of Jesus, God's son, you, Mary, will be with child. You will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His what? Kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, will never end. Never In many ways, it's a similarity to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 was written a thousand years before Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. It says in Psalm 2 verse 7, He said to me, you are my son, that's Jesus. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them as a king with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, that's worldly rulers, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord, that's one God, Yahweh, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, Jesus, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment well. Jesus Christ is the all-powerful God. He is our God. He is coming back. And it is so certain it's already being guaranteed in heaven, in the prophetic eras. It's done. It's sealed. We can talk about it as though it's already happened. And here in Revelation 11, we read with the coming of the seventh trumpet, prophecy is fulfilled over thousands of years. And then in Revelation 16, we watch its climax in the battle of Armageddon. Now, as we all pull this together, we're at the crossroads in Revelation at this point. We've reached the crossroads. In that the universe is about to be wrestled out of the hands of Satan and handed over to Jesus himself. It's a very important moment in the book. A moment that fulfills all of scripture. Now, as we close, there's one response. Just one response I want you to see. And that is in Revelation 11:16, the 24 elders who represent God's people, saved throughout history, all those saved from the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, all those saved from the 12 disciples of Jesus and their preaching in the New Testament, including us, 12 plus 12, 24, here they are sitting on thrones before the throne of God in heaven. Angels never sit on thrones. These are Christians. But here, and these 24 elders represent the people of God and they fall on their faces before God at this point in absolute worship at the return of Jesus Christ. And what is their response? Just look at this with me. Verse 16, And the 24 elders who were seated on thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, We what? Give thanks. We give thanks. Thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign Wow! For the church, for the people of God, you and I, Jesus' return is a time of great gratitude. We shouldn't fear the return of our Jesus. It's the greatest joyful thing that should be for all of our lives. Great gratitude that God has finally answered our prayers. Thy kingdom come. That all the prophecies about Jesus coming back are now fulfilled over thousands of years. 
And so thanks is a proper response to God from the Christian church. Thank you, God. I know my Jesus is coming back. I know he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I am so excited about it. And so they turn and they give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. In the Greek, the word Lord God Almighty means the ultimate powerful one. The one who is absolutely sovereign. Well, we thank you, Lord, that you are able to do this. We give you praise, Lord God. Do you realize this morning that everything, everything in your Bible is true? Everything? Everything? Do you realize this morning that we are living on borrowed time here? Borrowed time? Do you realize that the political parties of the world and the governments are living on borrowed time? That they and the people of the world will answer to God for their actions? Do you realize this morning that God's clock for this world and how we live is ticking down? Do you realize it's ticking? That everything that we read in Revelation is going to happen? Everything in the book of Revelation will happen? That Jesus, the glorious Son of God, is going to return to this earth? That this world's kingdom is going to change ownership? It's one kingdom and it's about to change ownership. That the godless of today, the wicked, the, the, the news of today is going to be forgotten in the future. Forgotten, unknown and uncared about. All the things that worry you and I so much is just going to be gone. How does the return of Jesus Christ excite your own soul this morning? Jesus is coming back for you. Amen. Amen. He has the title deeds of God in his hand. He took those in Revelation 6. The birth pains are here. We are living in the birth pains. Look at the difficulties that have changed the world since COVID. It's got worse. We're in the birth pains. The woman is about to give labor. A one world leader may already be on the world scene. He may already be in power somewhere in the world. Are you spiritually ready to come before Jesus Christ today? Who knows the timing of God? One year, five years, ten years, fifty years? We don't know. There needs to be peace in the Middle East. The United Nations are anxious for peace. The Bible says that an agreement will be signed that will bring seven years of peace. No more, they can't guarantee further. And then Jesus returns. Who knows? It may well be sooner than we think. Are you somebody today who deep down is excited for Jesus? Have you contemplated the return of Jesus Christ despite the busyness and the rush of your own life? Are you looking forward to Jesus? He's somebody who is real and he's coming back. He's coming back to claim his kingdom. He is coming back for you today. Are you spiritually ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Heaven is so excited, they're already rejoicing. Let's bow and pray before the King. <clears throat> Perhaps God has spoken into your heart this morning. Won't you just speak to the Lord? Perhaps you're so caught up with the worries and the issues of the world and life around you, one's lost an eternal perspective. Why don't you just ask God to speak into your heart again? To fire up a passion for the gospel, a passion for the return of Jesus Christ. If we're excited for Jesus' return, we have a passion to live life. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, we do thank you for the wonderful news that 
your return is not something <clears throat> that may or may not happen. Life just continues century after century and maybe Jesus is coming back at some point. Your word is going to put it in the prophetic aorist, which means that it is guaranteed in heaven. It is a signed deal. It is so certain that it's as though it's already happened. And that as we live here on this earth, we're literally waiting for that return. Lord, we also see this morning that there are events that need to happen in the world as we lead up to the return of you, Lord Jesus Christ. The seals need to be broken. And perhaps for us right now, Lord, we are in the birth pains. But perhaps for us, Lord, maybe a one world leader is already on the scene. The Bible says, as we have seen, that he will appear on the scene as an insignificant world leader. Not really of anybody of major worth. And then suddenly he will come to the forefront, bringing peace to the Middle East. That a seven-year peace agreement will be signed. The world can only guarantee peace in the Middle East amongst Israel and the Arabs for seven years. And from there, events will flow that lead to the seven trumpets. And then the seventh trumpet is blown that leads to your return and the seven bowl judgments. Lord, we seek and we wait for that day. We look with excitement May we be a people this morning who focused on our eternities. May we go home and pick up the Bible and for the first time, perhaps for some, just to open it and to start to read it. To start at the Gospel of Matthew. To get the Scriptures into our minds. To remember that, as D.L. Moody once said, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And Lord, help us to be a people this morning who approach it with great excitement and great passion. Help us to live life with passion now. Why? Because our hope is set on eternity and the return of seeing our Jesus. Glorify your name this morning, Lord, for Jesus' sake and God's people say, Amen. Amen.